Welcome to the Petro Papers podcast. Say that 10 times fast. This is where you get your oil and gas intellectual stimulation by asking the technical questions. I'm Yoga Sri Pradhan, and with me here today, I have Don Herman and Darby Witt. Today, we're going to talk about two SPE papers. Paper numbers in the description are in the description box for our YouTubers and our viewers and listeners on Apple Podcasts. I'm going to talk a little bit about Don Herman and Darby Witt before we start peppering them with questions. So Don Herman is a U.S. and sales business development representative at Cordax Evaluation Technologies. He's also the president and CEO of BGE Partners and business development manager at GR Energy Services. He also served as the CEO of Herman Resources and the director of business development at Schlumberger Oil Field Services. Now I'll talk a little bit about Darby. He's a completions technology specialist at Cordax Evaluation Technologies. He's also the president of Witt Petroleum Advisors and served as a uh, and served as a senior vice president of Reservoir Intelligence at Newtech. Welcome to the podcast, Don and Darby. Thank you, Yoshi. Appreciate the opportunity and glad to be here. Yeah, thanks, Yoshi. We we look forward to all your questions. <laughs> well, before I start asking questions about the HFTC papers, I wanted to let our viewers and listeners know a little bit about what does Cordax do? Well, perfect. Well, thank you again. Um, Yoshi, I'll go ahead and give you a, a thumbnail sketch about what Cordax does, what we do, and I'll uh, defer all the uh, technical questions to Darby, who's our uh, our completions expert. So simply, Cordex is in the business of well logging. Uh, we like to brand ourselves as the next evolution of, of well logging. Logging has been around for 100 plus years, but we kind of look at it more as the next revolution. It's, it's more of, okay, we can get the data. What the heck do we do with it? Um, you know, operationally, the primary differences are we are kind of the wireless version of well logging. We we displaced wireline and ostensibly we're a bunch of wireline guys who got rid of wireline, so it's kind of fun. Um, but our, our logging system, we have collars that run in the drill string and we uh, deploy our tools inside the drill pipe. So basically, our tools never leave drill pipes. So the, the main advantages are you can get the same quality of data at you know, much less cost and really eliminate the risk of sticking sources at the same time saving rig time that you don't have to use pulling pipe out and, and rigging up wireline. So it's, it's really an efficiency system. Um, and really, you know, we have been in business 10 plus years. Um, the, uh, the deployment system is very well vetted. And really since COVID, we've really been focused more on solutions. What do we do with the data? And how do we help our customers either save money, better understand the reservoirs, better design their completions. And now what Darby has really been driving within Cordax is more of the diagnostic side of how do we how do we evaluate completion success? So it starts with open hole logs, and then we provide um, quite a bit of other stuff. And uh, as I mentioned, Darby is is our completions expert, and I'll kind of turn it over to him. I'm available for any questions as well, but uh, we'd love to talk about the SPE papers and and what we've done with uh, completion design and, and diagnostics. Thank you, that's exciting to hear, Don. Now, since, I've got, since we've gotten a little bit of flavor of what exactly y'all do, I was wondering, Darby or Don, if you could walk through both the papers on what they talk about so we can orient our viewers and listeners. Right, yeah, and, and as you can probably tell from Don's introduction, Yoshi, the, Cordex has a lot of different applications for our data. So, you know, we can get 
we can get traditional logging data and near well bore description data in our wells at a con in a uh, convenient and economic way now and a risk really lowered the risk for acquiring logging data so it opens back up you know the ability to, to gather some data and understand completion and, and frack behavior and, and, you know, some production behavior. And so that's what has attracted me to Cordax is we just got some, you know, some great technology that I can once again have some sort of reservoir description to advise in my, you know, in my completions work which is what I've always, I've always done. So in, at HFTC, we had two papers. We had a 209130, which is a case study in the uh, Niagara and the DJ, in the DJ Basin and Niagara and Codell Wells, where we compared our post frac cluster efficiency logging service to, we compared the results of that to uh, permanent fiber installation. So that was a neat, we've been able to deploy that service and operationally a number of times, but this is the first time we had a direct comparison to what most people deem as the gold standard for cluster efficiency, which is you know DAS data from permanent fiber. So that was a, a really fun study and really long time coming, a lot of work involved in, and, uh, and, and getting this done and really validated uh, uh, our approach, I think. And, and it, it, it really, the, the data set exceeded our expectations. And I think it opens up a, a lot of other questions and potential for what the, the measurement is showing us. You know, I think there's more to that story that, that we're looking at evaluating, even on a case study in the DJ for another operator right now. So there's, there's Stay tuned. I think there's going to be more case studies that we publish uh, with that technique. Uh, and then the second paper, you know, is more, uh, again, we're always looking at, at data and trying to understand, trying to take the data that we have and understand uh, uh, reservoir behavior and fracture and, and completion behavior. So 209136, we were, we were, uh, fortunate to participate in this study, again, in the DJ Basin, uh, but it's focused on using flowback data as a, really the focus was using flowback data on these, on these Nibra and Codell wells as a completion signature. And I think that that's a really uh, interesting uh, approach. So uh, there's a lot to that paper for just on, on just a, a 19 well pad. Uh, but I think it's a very practical approach and something that can be applied, you know, to many unconventional basins, not just, you know, the Niagara Code L. It's interesting you mentioned that because when I was reading through that second paper, I was really interested in the diagnostics that you can get from load recovery and the, the water oil ratio and how you can quantify your effective fracture volume and how that was correlative to the microseismic. I'm, I'm already stating the ending of it, but how it's already correlative to the microseismic. So that, I found that pretty interesting. And that's something that I've been wanting to do internally. Yeah, and, and you know, what's neat about the, the Nibera, and we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit on that paper, but what's neat about the Nibera Codel is, is the water production is, you know, the, all of the water in the formation is bound. So, the, the water that they produce back is all frack, is all load water. And that, that early time flowback data, really less than 30 days, you can use that to not only anticipate the total load recovery for the well, but also you can use it as, you know, to look at that initial effective fracture volume, which is, you know, and then something we did at the end of the presentation that's not really in the paper itself, but we compared the from the from the from the RTA plots the the est ultimate uh, estimated ultimate oil recovery volume to the effective fracture initial effective fracture volume and kind of I think we have an interesting volume to volume ratio there that uh, I I would like to try to to see if people do more with I think that might be an interesting. Uh, ratio to compare, you know, 
maybe different acreages or different completion strategies that have been used across a across a basin. I agree. Well, I wanted to get into the weeds of the paper, specifically 209130, that first paper you summarized. I was curious to why higher neutron count rates indicate less fluid and lower count rates indicate more fluid. Okay, well, I mean, it's just the physics of the measurement. Can we show, can I share, share that presentation? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, that's not gonna, that's not gonna get us in trouble with the SPE, I don't, I don't believe. No, you uh, already presented it, so. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think it's asking you to disable. Oh, our... whoops. <laughs> Multiple participants can share, go for it. Okay, here we go. Let me see if I can find the uh, the correct uh, uh, window here. Okay. Okay. So, um, can you see the screen? Yes. Now I can. Okay. So when we look at the uh, the measurements, so what we're doing with this, uh, and this is a slide from the presentation, slide five from that presentation. So what we're doing in this paper is we're comparing a, a neutron measurement before frac and in the open hole, like Don mentioned, we obtain logs while you trip out of the hole with your drill bit. So you drill your well with our collars. Again, deploy our tools. Once you get reached the TD, deploy our tools to, to bottom. Then they seat in our collar and you log to memory while you trip out of the hole. So with that, we, we get a neutron reading. And so the neutron uh, tool, it, it emits the neutrons from, a, from a, uh, and detects them back from a, uh, at the receiver. And so we have a long space and a, and a short uh, detector, uh, short, you know, detector that, that emit into the formation. So the neutron, the, the uh, neutron is about the same size as the hydrogen atom. So it's heavily influenced by hydrogen. So as you log your well, if we see more neutrons back to the detector, that indicates less hydrogen or less fluid. And so if we get less neutrons back uh, back to the detector, then that indicates the presence of, you know, more fluid in that area of investigation. Thank you for that simple explanation. That was, yeah, thank you for that explanation. That was, that was much needed. And I know yeah. our viewers and listeners will definitely benefit from that as well. Yeah, and in the in the paper here, we're we're really presenting just count rates from the neutron. So you can see in an unstimulated section of the well bore, you can see how the case hole in blue, the count rates are higher than the open hole count rates, where where we don't have the effect of the casing. So the casing is actually displacing some of that fluid, and so in the case hole environment, we have less fluid, and therefore we have a higher neutron count rate. So that's why in the paper we talk about how those two environments really need to be normalized uh, to, it, to, to kind of get an apples to apples. And then, you know, with the open hole data and the case hole data, we see the, the changes within a stage, a frac stage due to the formation. And we can normalize those two environments and then we can begin to understand, you know, if there's anything changed beyond just that shift, then it's due to, you know, where the presence of the frac fluid or what's changed since that before frac and after frac, which is, you know, due to the presence of the fracturing fluids. Okay, thanks for that explanation. Thanks for clarifying that. I wanted to talk more about that paper. How can you tell which clusters are giving more SRV contributions and what's the radius of investigation of this SRV? Okay, so, so we're comparing, you know, as the tool, you know, it's a typical neutron uh, reading. So it's, it's less than, it's about a foot a radius of investigation. So it's a near well bore measurement. And that's when we talk about a near well bore frac water saturation or a near well bore SRV. That's really what we're detecting is just right there at the well bore. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we were surprised the fit to, to fiber DAS information was really so good because it really is just a, a close to the well bore measurement. Uh, but, but, you know, what we're seeing when we 
when we do the regression of the case hole and the open hole neutron, what we're detecting is that, that fluid curve and, and it does vary from stage to stage. And you can see it here in blue in this, in this chart, you can see that there's like for stage 34 here, there's not much fluid response in general for that stage versus stage 32. There is a lot of a big fluid response at the wellbore for that stage. And so I think there's some interesting observations from this from stage to stage that we're gonna be able to see. And we're doing a study now with another operator that's gonna combine uh, uh, oil soluble tracers so that we can see if there's a potential uh, production, uh, at least initial production difference between some of these stages that have more frac complexity implied by this, by this metric and less frac complexity. Uh, uh, applied by this metric. But the, the main thing and the goal of this study was to look at cluster efficiency. So when we see more fluid for this cluster versus less fluid for this cluster, we're gonna we're comparing the two and we're calculating cluster efficiency, you know, through that through this technique. So we're really just comparing the total fluid signature for the entire stage to what's present in and around each perforation. Awesome. Thanks for that explanation. Now I wanted to pivot to the second paper, 209136. And I know we talked about this just a very little bit earlier in this podcast, but I was wondering if you can explain to our viewers and listeners the water oil recovery versus load recovery plot and what are its implications? Uh, sure. I might show that that presentation uh, as well, just so that we can uh, refer to that. Uh, uh, so, so your question is, uh, again, is, is looking at the, uh, uh, the water oil recovery? Yes, plot. those plots. And what are its implications? If you can explain to viewers and listeners about those plots. Uh, Yeah, the, yeah. So what I, what I like about this is is you know we've got we've got kind of a range of data, but really the dark blue in this is is the just the flowback period alone. And 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 this work there's more there's more publications on this in, in this SPE paper we cite here two hundred one four six four which which Tamer and Doctor. Uh, uh, Hassan Dagenpour with the University of Alberta, they go into more detail about this technique. But really the, the exciting thing from it is the observation that we can really get this trend and get this prediction of, of load recovery, ultimate load, just from the early time flowback uh, data, which is, which is, you know, and, and typically less than 30 days. So that's pretty powerful if you're looking to try to uh, understand or predict the total amount of, of water recovered for, or water production from this well. And you're looking at uh, surface facilities or you know, economics of the well or, or, and then in this case, since we, since we determined that we can use this ultimate load recovery for, uh, for a, uh, to, to, to really compute the effective fracture drainage volume, uh, it, you know, just that, you know, with just a 30 day uh, or less of production data, you know, it becomes a pretty powerful metric. Awesome. Like I mentioned, I was excited to see this plot and I know I've heard about it before, but seeing it in the paper made me pretty excited to see just that water oil ratio and load recovery and, and load recovery fraction, just to see the power of the what the what the flowback data can 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 really tell you. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I and I like it, it you know, because it's we don't often, you know, we don't always have the opportunity to to look at years and years of production data when we're trying to make uh, we're trying to evaluate things, right? So I think there's some power to this. Just because we can, we can do a pretty good uh, uh, load recovery fraction, a pretty good estimation of that just from the the flowback data. And 
the paper, you talk about confirming the poor pressure gradients with some of that from the DFIT data too. And you were able to determine that reservoir pressure from that flowback data. So for our viewers and listeners, how does one determine that reservoir pressure from flowback data? Okay, that's, that's really shown here. So this is, you know, a, a, a flowback curve. And uh, this, this technique, it was first published, the, published by Jones in 2014. And so within our paper, there's a citation to that work uh, in the references. So this paper, this is a technique from Jones. And so really what you're seeing is you're seeing the end of that supercharge effect. So when we stimulate the reservoir, the first say 15 days in this case of flowback, we don't have any oil and gas production, any, any oil breakthrough with, into the, into the uh, production stream. So that's really demonstrating that our, our fracture is above the reservoir pressure, our, the pressure in our fracture is above the reservoir pressure, and we're producing that, that water flow from the fracture system until a point. And then at the point where we start to see hydrocarbon break through into the fracture and into the well bore, at that point, we get from, a, from the bottom hole flowing pressure calculation, we get a period of stabilized of stabilized pressure, okay? And so that's the end of that, uh, uh, of that, uh, that, so that indicates a, a poor pressure. And it's something that we can, we can obtain from the early, again, uh, the early flowback data. And what we wanted to do is confirm that technique with the, uh, with the DFIT data that we had. So we had, about six defects in this pad for the two child groups. And uh, there, there wasn't a lot of useful after closure data in the defect uh, for there was, it looks like there was some obstructions on the surface uh, with the data. Uh, so what we elected to do, we did have one good, uh, post-closure analysis with a good pore pressure to compare. And that compared very well to, the, to this Jones technique. So what we elected to do was to take the ISIPs from the defects, not, not from the, the FRAC data, but from the defects on, the, on these wells and plot those ISIPs compared to this, uh, to this Jones technique from the flowback. And you can see that that compared you know, compared reasonably well. So it's just a, another way to confirm that this Jones technique is giving us a good initial initial pore pressure for, for each well. Uh, and these, these whiskers here, you know, you could pick this flat period, you could pick a couple of different locations and that, so that indicates some of this spread in, this, in these whiskers here uh, from the picks. But, but you know, I was I was pleased with the comparison of the uh, you know with with the comparison of the DFIT ISIP and the uh, and the pore pressure gradient from the from the Jones technique. But the cool thing about the Jones technique is it allows us to get a a pore pressure on all the wells, not just the ones mm -hmm. that we defitted. Yeah, the reservoir engineer inside me got really excited when I saw that that the Jones technique was being explained here. And, uh, and, and y'all were talking about how you can estimate pore pressure from the flowback data. And that's exactly what we, that's exactly what I do internally. So I, I just wanted to get that clarification for our viewers and, and listeners. Yeah. And, and it's important to, in, in the paper steps through this for a reason, because we're gonna use this in, in our RTA plots. We need a pore pressure at, in order to do the RTA plots, you know, moving ahead. So that was, uh, uh, you know, I think that was a, a, a important, dis, you know, discovery. The, the, I'm sorry, the RNP plots. I'm sorry, I misspoke. But, uh. I was wondering for that second paper, could you explain how micro seismic dimensions were used and the correlation between the water oil ratio load recovery plot and the micro seismic? So. Uh. Can you explain yeah. how micro seismic dimensions were measured? And then can you explain the correlation between that 
water oil ratio load recovery plot in the micro seismic measurements? Yeah, the, the, uh, so what we did is we, because all of the water in the formation is bound, and so, and so we, could, we could look at this water oil ratio plot and estimate a, a, a total volume and effective fracture volume. And we compared that to the, the, micro, the data that the operator obtained from micro seismic. So when they stimulated the, the uh, child uh, zipper one group, they obtained some micro seismic data. And there's more that this was also, this study was also published in, in an SP paper at, uh, in February at, or at the first of this month at the, uh, at the conference. And so there's more information on the testing and some of the techniques in SPE 209155. Uh, and that's really, that paper really outlines, you know, the operator of Great Western and, and their testing procedures and what kind of what they did from a, from a fiber acquisition from a, and from a micro seismic data uh, uh, observations. So without getting, you know, too much into, into that work and a lot of it, you know, you know, that was the operator and the operator published a lot of that, of that data. Uh, but, you know, on these five wells, we had, we had some micro seismic uh, volumes uh, or micro seismic uh, uh, interpreted uh, uh, volumes from the micro seismic that we were able to plot and, and compare to the, uh, to the, the water oil ratio technique for, for you know, uh, an effective fracture volume. Uh, and, uh, and it compared pretty well. I, mean, I, would, I was happy with the, with the comparison uh, for this. You know, there are two, you know, the micro seismic, because these are so uh, brittle and, and hard rocks that we're talking about with the Niberian Codel, I was, you know, kind of surprised that we had such a such a good comparison. But you know, another another reason it's in the paper is just to illustrate that you know we feel like the effective fracture volumes that were coming coming from the from the water oil ratio technique, it, they you know they seem to make sense with the other diagnostic measurements that were taken. Thanks for that clarification. Well. I pepper you with a lot of questions, Darby, and Don, you might be able to uh, chime in on this one too, but I can't leave you both with this. I can't leave you both with this one particular question. What are some implications and applications of this work that we haven't seen before in our industry? And then if you can touch upon the results of the study, the second, for the, yeah, if you can touch upon the results of the, of both the, of both the papers. Sure, sure. Uh, Want me to do an intro on that, Darby? And let you take off. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Don. No, I I think Yoshi, you know, a lot of what we're doing has been contemplated over the last 10, 15 years. Um, but what we bring is a a deeper dimension of the looking at the data, but it's more the delivery system that it is now something operators can do very cost effectively without adding any risk to your operation. And if you look at other ways to do it, you're you know pumping tools outside a drill pipe, you get sources in the open hole, maybe you've got LWD, which the loss and hole risk is makes it a non starter. That you just can't do it. So it's a different way of looking at it. And for us it's it's a way to work with our operators and say, okay, the acquisition system is a make sense deal. And now what do we do with the data? And that's really what, what Darby brings to the show for us is really doing a deeper look at how do we apply this information and, and make it a positive towards the ROI equation for the operator. Okay. Yeah, and just to, just to add on to that, uh, you know, we feel like that there's there's probably more application for these measurements and some of this simple data collection. Uh, you know, that's what excites me. Uh, the flowback data, you know, it's I, I like it because it's readily available for operators. You know, operators are reporting that data, 
Uh, it's interesting to me that, you know, there's a lot of efforts and publications of people trying to do more with that, trying to understand more with that. But again, I feel like there's some synergy between the two papers, Yoshi. So, uh, so let me let me let me close. Let me talk about the cluster efficiency paper and and kind of show the, what I think the main takeaways from that are, and then we can talk about the flowback paper and then how I think they really uh, can be can be uh, can work together. Uh, and you can tell me if I'm uh, if I'm wrong. <laughs> Uh, so the main takeaway for, from, the main, from the cluster efficiency paper is, you know, we compared our technique before and after logging while tripping to, to the DAS data, and we had a very good correlation. And I was very pleased with this because, again, ours is a near wellbore measurement, and the DAS is looking at that acoustic noise distribution throughout time and allocating rate based on that noise. And... And you know, I think there's some interesting observations that happened, and I, we highlighted in the paper. We highlighted a couple of clusters that look like the DAS signal had more volume associated with them than what we see proportionally near the wellbore. So to us, that indicates you know that those are a couple of clusters that have more far field growth. Uh, so I think the combination of data sets is important. You know, we see just outside the wellbore a lot of these other fracture. Uh, uh, diagnostics, you know, often see inside the wellbore, or they're looking at noise along the wellbore. You know, I think the, together the combination uh, of, of measurements it, are, are telling us some things. And then when we start comparing the different signatures of these stages, you know, there's some, I think there's more data there that we've yet to understand. I think what we're seeing is evidence of of the influence of the cement density, which we can also see with our, with our log evaluation data. We can also see variability in the cement density uh, along the wellbore. And we see the influence of that on the fracturing performance in the, in the few tests we've been able to do so far. The, the, we see evidence of uh, what, I, what we interpret as more longitudinal and com high complexity along the wellbore with the fracture network versus a transverse signal. And I think that the, the near wellbore environment is what's really dictating that. And I think that there's some work we can do to anticipate these differences in fracture behavior. And I think that'll be important. It'll be important to how we stimulate these wells moving forward, uh, which of these different stages are contributing more to the production, but also, Flowback. Also, when we talk about flowback in 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 the areas you work and in the Niobrara that we talk about in this paper, you know, sand production is important. Sand flowback is problematic, and so I think if we have a a, a signature that shows more fluid and more frac complexity in the near wellbore, I think those are the stages that are going to contribute more to the sand flowback, and are going to be more problematic. And so there's some opportunity. By, by tying that to a near wellbore description, we can anticipate bad fracture behavior or different fracture behavior, and we can, we can begin to address some of those concerns. So if sand flowback is, is problematic and it's costing operators money, maybe we can treat, maybe, maybe instead of changing the frac strategy for the entire well, maybe we can address the the handful of stages that are going to give us the most amount of problems. So that's something that's on our mind. But but really, just the the net of this paper is that we feel like there's some understanding on a per stage level that can be uh, accelerated due to a, just some simple logging measurements. You know, tried and true logging measurements, uh, and that's really kind of the net of 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 that paper. The other, uh, and I'll uh, share the, the screen again, the other paper, one of the, the main takeaways that I got really excited about from the flowback paper is, you know, we're talking about looking at uh, uh, an effect, initial effective fracture volume that's connected back to, to connected to the wellbore. And then comparing that to, in the paper, we, we had, Quite a bit of production data, so we could we could use RTA plots to estimate an ultimate 
uh, oil production. And so I think comparing this QM oil production to this initial effective fracture volume, again, I think this uh, volume to volume ratio, it might be something interesting that could come from that uh, moving forward. It might be an interesting me uh, metric uh, moving forward. And how I think these two technologies, these two papers really mix and what's in our mind at Cordex is how can we take this per well fracture volume and how can we, uh, how can we distribute that to each stage? How, how can we understand the stage behavior and take the stage behavior and the pressure data behavior uh, and maybe what we can index from our logs and, and compare that to the flowback data and merge the two. And that's, what I, that's where I think the, the frack water saturation measurement can really help. We can look at complex frack complexity uh, and compare it from stage to stage and use that frack water as a way to, uh, to, to, to compare uh, completion efficiency. Uh, so I, I think there's some, there, you know, we're still in the infancy of combining all of these different measurements, but I think the, the frack complexity and that and how well we stimulate that near well bore region and how, what that fracture geometry in the near well bore looks like and our total cluster efficiency, I think that's a big driver to, to how effective our wells are producing, to how, to how well and economically our wells are, are, are producing. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited about looking, you know, more into this data and hopefully we'll have operators, you know, many operators, active operators that are interested in gathering this data and working with us to, you know, to try to, to try to improve, you know, understanding. We, we believe that if you don't measure, how can you improve if you don't measure? And we offer operators, you know, a practical way, low cost, low risk way to make some measurements. Great. Well, thank you both, Don and Darby, for being on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, you know, we're available. I don't know if you want to send out our email addresses or whatever to anybody, but any questions or interest in, you know, a deeper dive, we're more than happy to do that. Perfect. Well, you heard straight from Don and Darby regarding the papers 209130 and 209136. You let me pepper them with questions regarding the technical sides of both of these papers. I am Yoko Shipradan, and I'm signing off. <laughs>